In this lecture, we'll discuss congenital T-cell deficiencies and combined immunodeficiency disorders. Let's review what the T-cell is doing. The T-cell is responsible for destroying intracellular and other invading organisms like bacteria, viruses, fungi, or parasites. The T-cell also facilitates the B-cell in producing antibodies. Therefore, patients with T-cell disorders may have humoral deficiency as well. So let's do some examples. In kids, we may see severe combined immune deficiency, or SCID. This is what the bubble boy had. We may see patients with ataxia telangiectasia, and we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome. And lastly, we'll close with, with a discussion of DeGeorge syndrome. These are all examples of T-cell disorders in children. So typically, in children with defunct T-cells, they'll present relatively early in childhood, between two and six months of age. And usually, they present with severe infections from organisms that don't cause severe disease in those with a normal immune system. An example would be a severe infection with a common virus, or a severe infection with yeast, such as a candidal oral candidiasis that's gone horribly wrong, or mycobacterium, or pneumocystis. Pneumocystis is a common presentation for patients with no T-cells. So how do we diagnose a T-cell disorder? Well, we may see a reduced lymphocyte count on CBC. Or, on the CBC smear, we may notice abnormal morphology of the T-cells. But if we wish to make the diagnosis definitively, we order a flow cytometry. The flow cytometry will demonstrate deficiency of T-cell subpopulations or of all T-cells, depending on the problem. A chest x-ray may also reveal something in that in children with an absent thymus, which we can't see on the x-ray, those children may have a T-cell deficiency. So let's think about how patients present when they have T-cell deficiencies. And we'll start with SCID, or Severe Combined Immune Deficiency. These patients have a severe deficiency of both B-cells and T-cells. They are extremely susceptible to infection infancy, and it's very rare that we would fail to make the diagnosis relatively quickly. They often will have failure to thrive. The way we're going to treat these children is by treating them with a bone marrow transplant before the age of three months. We need to avoid public exposure prior to transplant. In general, with these patients, when they have so few T cells, we provide them with PJP prophylaxis through trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, usually starting at about a month of age. And these patients may receive IVIG infusions because IVIG persists for maybe three weeks, and this will replace their missing immunoglobulin from their B cell dysfunction as a result of their T cell deficiency. In patients with ataxia telangiectasia, they may present slightly differently. These patients have a combined deficiency of T cells, immunoglobulins, and they also have neurocutaneous findings from which you can easily make the diagnosis. The defect of ataxia telangiectasia is in a gene called the ataxia telangiectasia mutated protein, or ATM. This protein facilitates DNA repair. And as a result, these patients are at risk for immunodeficiency. Generally, they will present with truncal ataxia by the age of two years of age. Very quickly, they will be wheelchair-bound, usually by school age. What's key is we can see eye telangiectasias typically by the age of five. This is an example of an eye telangiectasia. It's a very complex bed of capillaries. They then get skin telangiectasias as well, usually by the age of seven. These patients will have immunoglobulin deficiency, and infections are common, especially sinopulmonary infections. They can also develop leukemia or lymphoma, which occurs in about 10% of patients. Remember, they can't do DNA repair, so they're likely to develop cancer. Let's switch to Wiscott-Aldrich syndrome. This is an X-linked recessive trait. 
So the boys are much more likely to be affected, and an affected girl is usually just a carrier. This is a defect in the function of T cells and B cells, and also platelets. It's usually diagnosed in the first year of life, and 20% can go on to develop lymphoma, and 40% have autoimmune disease. Most of these patients sadly die before they are 10 years old. In wiscott aldridge syndrome, about a 30% of them, or a third, have the classic triad, which is eczema, thrombocytopenia, and chronic otitis media, which is an example of an infection they can get as a result of immunodeficiency. But they also get all kinds of other infections because of their immunoglobulin deficiency, sinopulmonary infections, for instance, pneumonia or sinusitis, and they are at risk for viral and other opportunistic infections as well. Lastly, let's touch on DeGeorge syndrome. DeGeorge syndrome is another disease where patients can get T cell deficiency, but they don't always have it. There's a wide variety of severity of DeGeorge syndrome. It's a deletion of 20QQ11, and these patients will have midline defects. Affects the brain, they may have effects of the face, such as hypertelorism or a cleft palate. It affects their midline glands, like their thyroid or their parathyroid, but it can also affect their thymus. And the thymus is responsible for making T cells, so they may have a T cell deficiency. Keep in mind they can also have heart findings, and multiple congenital heart defects are possible. So, patients with DeGeorge who have their thymus involved will develop thymus aplasia resulting in a T-cell deficiency. It's highly variable how severe their disease is, and we generally provide supportive care. So that's my summary of the congenital reasons why children might have T-cell deficiency. Thanks for your attention.